This time, I've got a USB fingerprint scanner. There are a number of types of fingerprint scanners out there. This one happens to be capacitive, as we'll see later. This fingerprint scanner happens to be a Trumi brand. It only gets three stars on Amazon, but that's okay. I only got it to take it apart anyway. On the back, we see all the standard compliance labels for consumer products, FCC, CE, UL, WE, and so forth. All right, let's, let's take a crack at this. Well, looks like I was wrong to assume there would be any screws underneath that sticker. Let's see if there are any screws underneath this rubber backing. And it doesn't look like there are any screws underneath that rubber backing. Unfortunately, it's either clipped together or glued together, and I really hope it's not the latter. Let's see. As you can see, I don't have a spudger tool like the professionals, I just have to use my flathead screwdriver, but oh well. It was glued together, but the glue wasn't very strong, so it actually was pretty easy to take apart. As you can see, this is a sensor that reads your fingerprint. These are some test points for the USB data lines. On the back, we have a couple of ICs. Uh, this one and this one, we have a crystal oscillator. Let's see if we can peel this off. Let's take a closer look. Now, I try to look up this chip here. It's, it appears to be a TCD42A1DND, and I'm not finding a data sheet at the moment. I'm assuming it's one of those chips that you can only get data for if you speak Chinese. Um, we've got a crystal oscillator here. We have uh, an LED and a power transistor to drive it. We have another transistor or something like that there and a couple more chips. I don't think it's too important to see what those are. The interesting stuff happens on the front. This sensor is an integrated circuit. I don't know its part number or if it has one, but I'm pretty sure I know how it works. It has two pieces of metal on either side, and it has this gold colored strip down the middle and then two black areas surrounding that golden strip. These strips of metal on the sides come in contact with your finger as it swipes across, and they eliminate noise coupling into the sensor. These black strips on either side of the gold strip prevent light from coming in and polluting the rest of the circuit underneath. And this gold strip is the actual sensor array. Let's take a closer look at that. This is the sensor chip. The edges are lined with metal that comes in contact with your finger and prevents noise from getting coupled into the sensor. The gold strip running down the middle is a sensor array. On either side of the gold strip is a black mask that prevents any light from entering the rest of the chip. The gold strip itself is made up of an array of little tiny pieces of metal. We can see that the metal strip is comprised of five pieces of metal from left to right and many, many, many rows all the way down to the other end of the chip. For comparison, this is what my finger looks like at this zoom level. These sensor plates just need to be smaller than the ridges in my fingerprint in order to be able to resolve the details. In a nutshell, this is how it works. The sensor chip is built on a piece of silicon, the same type of silicon chip that computer processors are made on, except that in this case the feature size is a lot bigger than what's demanded inside computers, so this can actually be manufactured quite a bit cheaper for the same silicon area. On top of the sensor chip is a sensor array, just a bunch of little pieces of metal. On top of the sensor array is a piece of hard protective glass, and on top of the protective glass slides your finger. Your finger is presumed to have ground potential because it is also touching the pieces of metal at the edges of the sensor. As your finger slides along, your fingerprint's valleys and ridges come into contact with the glass. When charge is applied to the sensor plates, then an electric field propagates to those ridges and valleys. The distance that those field lines have to go through is obviously different from one sensor to another depending on whether it is covered by a ridge or a valley. Additionally, field lines that terminate into a valley must travel through a distance of air. And air has a particularly low permittivity or dielectric constant than the glass, and therefore the capacitance of this plate, which is covered by a valley, is a little bit lower than the capacitance of this plate, which is covered by a ridge. All that the sensor chip needs to know is whether there's a ridge or a valley, and how fast the finger is moving to draw an accurate map. How does the chip measure the capacitance? This circuit was taken from the Sony CXA3271 AGE, but whatever scheme our chip uses is going to be something similar. 
In this schematic, this node is the sensor node. CS is the capacitance from the sensor node to the user's finger, or ground, and CP is the parasitic capacitance from the node to the chip. CP prime is a replica capacitance of the same value as CP, also to the chip. It's used to cancel out the parasitic capacitance. We have an op amp, CF, a feedback capacitance that sets the amplifier's gain, and three voltages, VL for low voltage, VM for medium voltage, and VH for high voltage. The switches are switched in succession depending on whether it is presently phase 1, phase 2, or phase 3. During phase 1, this switch, this switch, and this switch are closed. The op amp behaves as a buffer, driving the sensed node to equal V high. In the second phase, this switch, this switch, and this switch are closed. The op amp still behaves as a buffer, driving the replica capacitance voltage to equal VL. In the third phase, this switch, this switch, and this switch are closed. The fact that these two switches are closed causes this low voltage on CP prime to cancel out with the high voltage on CP. Thus, the only charge that's amplified is that due to the sensed capacitance, not the parasitic capacitance because it's cancelled out. VM is chosen to be midway between VL and VH, and the amplifier amplifies the charge according to the capacitance of the feedback capacitor. How much voltage does this circuit output? Well, let's take a look at the familiar capacitor charge equation, Q equals CV. The voltage output is going to be equal to the charge stored on our sensed capacitor divided by the capacitance of our feedback capacitor, CF. How much charge is going to be stored on our sensed capacitor? The charge Q stored on the sensed capacitor is going to depend on the difference between the voltage VH and VM. Why? Well, during phase 1, the capacitance CS was charged to VH by the op amp behaving as a buffer. In phase 3, the sensed voltage is driven to VM, the difference being that a feedback capacitor is used instead of a switch for the op amp. So, the charge stored on the sensed capacitor is equal to the sensed capacitance times the delta V between VH and VM. Finally, the output voltage of this amplifier is going to be equal to CS times VH minus VM divided by CF. VH, VM, and CF remain constant, so we can determine our sensed capacitance CS. From there, the output voltage is fed to a sample and hold and can be amplified using traditional techniques. Finally, an analog to digital converter is used to read the signal into the chip, where it is then processed to find the fingerprint pattern. So there you have it. That's how your average run-of-the-mill fingerprint sensor works. The same operating principle of using switches to transfer charge around to measure capacitance is also used in capacitive touch sensors and many other applications. If you want to see more, please like this video and subscribe. See ya!